Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. My name is Simon Joseph, and I'm the marketing manager here at In House Recruitment, the fastest growing community for in house recruiters and HR professionals in the industry. Today's webinar is in partnership with Manpower Group, the world's workforce expert, helping organizations transform by sourcing, assessing, developing, and managing the talent they need to win. Every day, Manpower Group connects more than 600,000 people with meaningful work opportunities. The title of today's webinar is Preparing for Uncertainty, Successful Talent Strategies for 2020, which is one of the hottest topic areas within the industry today, especially at this time of year. And we're delighted to be joined by Alpesh Palaja, Lead Economist at CBI, and Chris Gray, Director at Manpower Group, who will be our speakers for the next 30 minutes or so. Before we get under I'd have a bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box to the right-hand side of the screen, and we'll make sure to come back to these at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Alpesh. So Alpesh, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Simon. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Simon mentioned, I'm just going to give a very uh, brief overview of how the UK labour market has done so far, what we can expect further ahead, and any key things that your business uh, should be uh, looking to consider. So kicking off, um, the broad story is very much one of strong growth in the labour market uh, since the financial crisis and particularly since 2012. Uh, the growth that we've seen has actually surpassed that uh, in pre-crisis years, which is very um, encouraging. And this is a real success story for the UK economy uh, during what has actually been quite a turbulent time. Uh, we had a long period of quite weak growth uh, from about 2010, 2011, uh, followed by the Eurozone crisis, the Scottish referendum in 2012, and most recently Brexit. And throughout all that, the labour market has actually uh, held up quite well. Um, and when we look back at previous downturns, uh, employment actually took a relatively small hit during the 2008-9 recession, and that actually explains some of the, the the strong growth that we saw in the initial stages of the recovery. Um, that's quite atypical. Usually during recessions, employment takes quite a large hit and, and with, a, with a sort of a long lag. Um, so we saw a very deep recession in 2008-9, uh, but the labour market actually held up better than would, be, than would have been expected uh, given the size of the downturn. And it is important not to underestimate how much of a big deal this is. When we look at the major drivers of economic growth over time, the contribution of the labour market has actually been pretty constant post-crisis. In fact, it's actually been a little bit stronger. Um, the slowing in growth that we've seen uh, in post-crisis years over the last 10 years or so has actually been down to um, uh, lower, lower capital accumulation, so lower investment, if you like, um, and falling productivity, which essentially can be equated to efficiency. So had it not been for the strength in employment that we saw, um, growth would have been uh, much worse than it has been. And that does lead to a lot of questions and claims that sort of employment growth hasn't been of a very good quality. Um, there are lots of headlines about it driven by sort of unsecure work and sort of gig economy type stuff and exploitative work practices. Um, for the most part, that's actually untrue. Uh, most of the growth has actually been driven by employees, so people in kind of secure work on secure contracts, um, getting the sort of legal rights that they deserve. Um, what is notable is the growing contribution of self-employment uh, to the labour market recovery. That's driven about a quarter um, of labour market growth since 2012. Um, that Part of that at least comes back to the growing participation of older workers in the labour market, uh, those close to or at retirement age who are sort of looking to supplement their income, um, their income in retirement by sort of doing a bit more work on the side. Uh, that could that could come back to sort of, you know, uh, higher longevity, life expectancies rising um, and people just kind of want to want to keep their skills up to date. And we also see that story when we look at data on zero hours contracts, and that obviously got a lot of media coverage a few years ago. Um, zero hours contracts have indeed risen, uh, but they are still only a tiny proportion of the workforce, only about 3% of employment. Um, we did see a jump in 2013. That paradoxically might have been due to the increased media coverage, sort of more people realising that they're on zero hours contracts um, and then self-classifying as such. So this does pose the question as to why employment has actually been so strong um, 
you know, at a time when economic growth has been such weaker. And that indeed is still a little bit of a puzzle. And um, certainly in the early stages of the recovery, we were hearing a lot about labour hoarding. So firms actually not wanting to get rid of staff. They didn't want to lose key skills in the event that the economy turned up. Um, but actually another reason uh, that, you know, that doesn't really explain the growth in employment that we've seen since. Um, one reason could be that we have seen a long period of quite high uncertainty post-crisis. And actually uncertainty has has structurally shifted higher, marred by sort of the crises and the events uh, that I spoke about earlier. And during such an environment, it might actually just be easier to grow a business through hiring more people, uh, as opposed to other forms of investment, which sort of represent a much bigger sunk cost. And that's obviously facilitated by the flexibility of the UK's labour market, which is a huge asset. And that growth in the labour market, that tightness that we're seeing, uh, is does seem to be feeding through to pay. Uh, so nominal pay, so this is before inflation has been taken into account, uh, actually uh, has been picking up over the last couple of years and has, and has sort of uh, peaked at about 4% or so. Um, that that pickup in pay, however, did take a long time to come through. So sort of despite the persistent growth in the labour market, pay was actually um, quite subdued for a long time. Um, some of that more recent pickup has been uh, driven by the lifting of the public sector pay cap in 2017, but look, that's not been the only driver of the recovery. That sort of helped at the margin, but it has very much been seen here across both the private and public sectors. Um, but while living standards are improving, it has been quite a tough decade for household, households. So, so this chart shows real wages, so this does account uh, for inflation, um, and that's quite, uh, and that's what's sort of important for spending power and household spending. So during and after the Great Recession, we saw a very long period um, of falling pay. Uh, that it was unprecedentedly long. Actually, you'd need to go back, uh, in fact, to the late 1600s to see, uh, a, you know, that 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 uh, long period of sort of consecutive falling pay. Um, and then we sort of saw an improvement uh, in the lead up to the referendum, but then sort of, you know, post the EU referendum 2016, the pound fell sharply, uh, that drove up inflation, and we saw sort of uh, a bit a bit of a deterioration in living standards again. Um, and then more recently, as inflation has fallen back and wage growth has picked up, real pay has been uh, strengthening, but it is still very much below uh, its, its peak in 2008, so just before the recession. So households really have had uh, a pretty uh, tough time. And the flip side of strong employment, obviously, is that productivity has been quite weak. Now, productivity is quite an esoteric term that kind of tends to be thrown around uh, a lot by economists. Um, it's measured here as output per hour. So it's essentially a gauge of efficiency in the economy. How efficiently are businesses using their inputs um, to produce? Um, and productivity is a key driver of wages over the long run. It enables a firm to raise pay without sort of incurring additional costs, uh, at least additional average costs. Um, and productivity has essentially been stagnant since the crisis and is about 20% below it where it would have been um, had the pre-crisis trend continued. So that is quite a large gap. Uh, and that's been, a, that's been a key constraint uh, on pay growth. Um, productivity matters for living standards and particularly growth over the longer run. Uh, it comes back to the chart that I was talking about earlier where productivity has been a drag on growth since the crisis. And this is a big challenge for the economy, uh, one that's been a bit buried in the Brexit noise recently, and is something that policymakers really need to turn their attention to tackling. So the overall picture so far has been one of strength in the labour market, but we are seeing signs of that sort of starting to tail off now. Um, that's been most notable when we look at the number of vacancies, which is a bit of a lead indicator of employment growth, and those have been falling since the summer. Uh, the decline was initially concentrated in smaller firms, but then it sort of broadened out to larger companies as well. Um, and indeed, off the back of that, we have seen a couple of months where sort of employment has been falling, not very sharply, but 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 sort of quite modestly. And we sort of expect that to continue in the near term. So the CBI's own uh, forecast is for sort of employment to fall modestly for the rest of this year. But we then expect uh, employment growth to sort of pick up uh, in 2020 and 2021, just as economic growth firms as Brexit uncertainty fades. Um, throughout our forecast, however, the, the growth that we're seeing in employment remains sort of below what we've seen um, over the last few years. Um, so, you know, th this should be interpreted as a story of the labour market sort of normalising, where growth is sort of plateauing, it's tailing off. We aren't expecting another big downturn 
um, in employment. And of course, you know, this was always to be expected at some point. The strength in the labour market could only continue uh, for so long. Uh, but, but as I say, we do expect hiring to continue growing, but just at a slower pace than we've seen in the recent past. And it is important to bear in mind that that normalisation is happening from a point of strength and a point of great tightness in the labour market. So when we look at sort of a range of indicators of labour market tightness, many of which are monitored by the Bank of England when they're setting monetary policy, uh, there isn't a lot of spare capacity in the labour market. Um, and actually, we expect that to remain the case over, over our forecast. So we expect sort of the unemployment rate to just tick marginally higher, sort of passing a little bit above the 4% mark, but it actually stays quite close to the multi-decade lows uh, that we have seen um, over our forecast. Um, and taking one element of that labour market titus, tightness, um, skill shortages are actually quite high, uh, both in the CBI's own business surveys and in other indicators, for example, uh, in the Bank of, England, Re Bank of England's regional agent scores. Um, we kind of rely a lot, I mean, the CBI relies a lot on an anecdote from its members in this regard, and there doesn't appear to be one real key driver of the pickup in, in skill shortages. Certainly, businesses talk a lot about shortages and skills of sort of related to digital and cyber security work. Uh, it has been exacerbated by the EU referendum with a lot of EU migrants going back home. Um, and firms have really been doing all they can to sort of fill these key roles in their business. We hear a lot about sort of businesses raising pay to attract the right staff but for sort of individual roles, although holding off on sort of large scale pay rises for their workforce. Some are turning to automation um, and that's likely to be a key theme uh, in the economy going forward. Um, and this sort of tightness and, and these labour shortages is a key theme to bear in mind for your recruitment strategies. You know, you might need to be a bit more creative um, to fill the roles that you want to fill and sort of to deliver uh, what you need to. Um, and the other key theme of, of sort of what lies ahead is, is we do expect pay growth to slow. Um, our judgment is that pay growth has probably peaked um, at about 4% in, in sort of that in, in, in nominal terms. Um, but we do expect inflation to remain actually relatively contained. So real wages will still be rising, uh, but at a, at a slower pace than we've seen recently. And obviously low inflation does give some room for manoeuvre in sort of pay setting and pay awards. Uh, the big caveat here is what happens with Brexit. Uh, so a disruptive outcome to Brexit, particularly sort of a disruptive no deal outcome, would probably result in another sharp fall in the pound which would sort of push inflation higher and sort of eat into those uh, into those gains in real wages that we've seen so far and the gains that we expect going forward. Um, and part of the reason why we expect pay growth to slow is that productivity remains quite weak throughout our forecast. Um, that's mostly coming from GDP growth. We expect GDP growth to pick up, but to, but to be relatively subdued. Actually, the labour market is holding up quite well. Um, and that does keep a lid on pay awards. And as I mentioned, this is a much this has much broader implications for the UK's potential to grow over the longer term. And as mentioned, it is a challenge that policymakers really do need to address. And just ending uh, very quickly uh, on the labour supply point, uh, a key factor di dictating the availability of labour uh, will be what a post Brexit immigration regime looks like. Uh, migration flows have actually softened since the referendum, and that's very much coming through uh, on the EU side. Um, Brexit is obviously playing a role. You know, a lot of migrants have reported sort of feeling unwelcome and are sort of, you know, going back home. But also the sharp fall in the pound that we've seen since the referendum means that, that wages sent back home are actually worth a lot less than they were. And we have seen relatively stronger economic growth, particularly in emerging Europe, in Eastern Europe. So a lot of people are just choosing not to come here because sort of opportunities um, have been a little bit better relative to the recent past. Um, Obviously, that that sort of that's exacerbated labour shortages for firms, and that's even before we've had any substantive changes uh, to to sort of immigration policy. Um, a tighter immigration regime may exacerbate those labour shortages further, um, particularly for sectors very heavily dependent on migrant labour. Um, obviously, there is still a lot of uncertainty in this regard, and it is uh, one to watch uh, over the next couple of years, particularly as talks with the EU uh, progress. Um, so that's sort of a brief um, a brief overview of the labour market and what we ex expect. And um, just to sum up, obviously the big picture has been one of quite strong growth. 
uh, it's growth that we see sort of tailing off, if you like, rather than uh, rather than sort of reversing completely. We we sort of expect a normalisation in the labour market rather than a big downturn. Um, it's pretty encouraging that we've seen wage growth recovering, and that that follows a a, a long squeeze in living standards uh, for firms. Um, but you know, I you know the overall picture remains very much one of tightness in the labour market. We've got that weakness in productivity. Skill shortages are quite high. Uh, what happens over migration? Um, it's worth sort of thinking about all of these things and what they mean for your business and for your recruitment strategies. And certainly, those opposing forces of of softer but still growing demand and tight supply will sort of will both be sort of influencing pay growth and we expect pay growth to slow but certainly the risks are very much to the upside given how uh, tight uh, the labor market is um that's it from me um i will now hand you over to chris thank you alpesh and good morning everyone we live in uncertain times uh, and uh, 2020 will be a year of change. I've highlighted here some of the macro and policy drivers that are going to contribute to this uncertainty, and you'll probably be aware of many of these. But looking ahead, what are the key macro and policy drivers that create this uncertainty? Firstly, well, we all know we've got a general election tomorrow, uh, and I'm not gonna make any political comment on this. You will know what the leading parties are, and they're all talking about change. Investment and an increase in the size of the public sector is on the cards. A new government, whatever the political colour, will try to bring new ideas or continue with what, what has already been announced. Secondly, we have IR35 due in April. This promises some of the most significant changes to the contractor market ever. From next year, employers will have to decide on an individual's employment status and the making of necessary statutory payments. And this will also see employers being held financially accountable for these decisions. We also have some other change on its way. We can't avoid Brexit. Uh, understandably, this is weighing on the minds of many. Next year will be an important one that will give more, uh, more certainty to what our relationship with the EU will look like. And a new immigration system that will shape how we access talent from outside the UK. The Good Work Plan also takes effect from April and will impact the labour market. We'll see the removal of the Swedish derogation, also known as pay between assignments, the introduction of a written statement for all workers and a new way to calculate holiday pay. Globalisation continues to shape business too, from the markets that we source from and sell products into, and how the tariffs will also impact us. So what about the jobs market? Well, yesterday we released the Manpower Group Employment Outlook Survey. This looks at future hiring plans of UK employers, and we've run it for over 50 years. We interviewed over 2,100 employers across the country to discover their hiring plans. And so what is MIOS, as we call it, telling us? Well, uncertainty weighs heavily on the minds of many employers in the new year. Hiring confidence is muted. And whilst it is the weakest result since 2012, we continue to see a mixed uh, but positive employment outlook. And as I say, it is a mixed picture, as you can see here. However, employers in the majority of regions and sectors are still adding or retaining staff in the first quarter of 2020. The most promising region is the West Midlands, followed by Scotland and the Northwest. And when we, when we look at the business sectors, it's mining, manufacturing and construction employers who lead, who are leading the way. Megatrends. What are the workforce megatrends that we talk about? In our business, we talk about megatrends that shape and guide the economy, our clients, businesses, and our own. These underpin changes in the world of work, in business and organizations of all sizes, and in particular, what it means for the access to talent. The megatrends we uncovered are, Demographics or the talent mismatch to find people with the right skills in the right place in the face of changes such as aging workforce as mentioned by Alpesh earlier. The rise of customer sophistication. Customers are more sophisticated when making buying decisions, demanding suppliers to be ever more agile and delivering value for money. Technological revolutions, how technology fundamentally changes how so much work is delivered 
and informs how employers engage with their workers. Individual choice, how people want more say about how and where they work as we embrace the multi-generational workforce. If we just focus on technological revolutions and, and look at this change in a bit more depth, there are some significant changes on the way. We hear a lot about how AI and robots will impact the world of work. How are employers responding and what does this really mean? Our research last year shows that 84% of the 19,000 employers we surveyed globally expected to upskill their workforce by 2020 to deal with this rapid acceleration of both emerging new skills and skills redundancy. AI will both eliminate and create jobs. By 2020, AI was predicted to become a net positive job motivator, eliminating 1.8 million jobs, whilst at the same time creating 2.3 million jobs. And the Gartner research survey shows that 77% of employers believe AI will lead to more humans wanted, humans to implement and maintain AI, and humans to do the roles created by the opportunities for scale that AI provides. Technology is here to stay and its impact will be continuous. It's a constant, it's disrupting work, it requires new skills. It is replacing some jobs, but it's also creating other jobs. But to benefit from investments in technology, we also need to invest in people. You need people with the right skills to be able to work with and implement any technology. If you don't make these wider investments, then you will never fully realize the benefits of your IT investment. So to echo what Alpesh said earlier, we face a tight labor market. The ONS also tells us that we have around 800,000 unfilled vacancies. We continue to face a critical shortage of skills. Employers are struggling to find the skilled talent they need. Our own research shows that 19% of employers are struggling to fill roles due to a lack of candidates. When we look at employer size, one in two large employers struggle to fill these roles. You can see on screen some of the key roles that employers are struggling with. Over the last decade, these top 10 have changed very little. Skills shortages are dominated by skilled trades, drivers and the healthcare sector, all the way through to professionals, sales staff and management. We've talked about the pressures that have been facing employers in 2019. We've touched on where we see the jobs market going in the new year. We've touched on some of the bigger issues, such as the mega trends and long-term shortages of talent. We know the labor market is incredibly tight, changing technologies are constant, and the skills needed are changing all the time. We are facing challenges and uncertainty. How do employers navigate these choppy waters in 2020? At Manpower, we talk about something called the four Bs. These are the strategies that will help manage your workforce today and get it ready to deliver business goals for tomorrow. You could consider them like a set of dials that you turn up and down as required. They are build, which is to build talent internally by equipping employees with the right skills through training and coaching. Buy, you don't have the skills in your organization now, let's buy them in. In other words, recruiting people. We have borrow, another type of recruitment, but this time temporary or contingent, bring people into your organization to help you on an on-demand basis. Finally, how can you make people to move on to new roles, either within your organization or outside it? If we look at build first, companies are realizing they can no longer expect to find just-in-time talent, even if they're willing to pay the premium for it. Our research shows that 84% of employers will upskill their current workforce, up from just 21% in 2011. How are we addressing this in our own business? There's a critical shortage of HG, HGV drivers. So we teamed up with a partner called Specialized Training Services to create a driver academy with the aim of bringing more than 4,500 newly qualified HGV drivers into the labor market each year. The result is not just more HGV drivers, but better prepared, better supported, and highly motivated additions to the logistics industry. We're really pleased with the feedback we're getting from both candidates and clients alike. Recently, a client told us that the newly qualified driver we placed with them from the academy 
is one of their best drivers, bringing new behaviors and a different way of different, doing things into their business. They're fully invested in the model and hope to bring in more academy drivers. Build is going to be increasingly important for all organizations. Our research suggests that up to, uh, by 2022, over half, which is 54% of all employees, will require significant reskilling and upskilling. What is crucial is what we call learnability. For the employer to encourage and foster the idea of continuous learning and the same for the individual. So now turning to buy, and I suspect we're all familiar with this already. However, there are two strands to this. The first is about bringing in the permanent talent you need that you can't grow yourself. This could be about the new IT staff to run the new systems, apps developers, or the social media team that all businesses need today. The second is increasingly about reward for new employees, but also about how you remunerate your staff. 79% of employers plan to buy the skills they need, either paying higher market prices to attract new employees or improving compensation for existing staff. In a tight labor market, candidates definitely hold the power. Those with sought after skills are commanding ever higher pay. Employers also need to focus on the, the wider employer brand and what's it, what's, what is its proposition, how they create standout amongst the other organizations which are on offer as well. Candidates getting more salary. They want to know a company's ethical approach, its training and flexible working opportunities amongst others. Borrowing the skills you need can help you deliver a specific project, cover a busy period or tide you over while you establish a longer term solution to skills gaps within your organization. For example, warehousing, retail and hospitality all need to respond to the increased activity around a very topical time, Christmas, from Black Friday to the January sales by establishing a contingent and flexible workforce from the warehouse to the shop floor to drivers. With new skills emerging at an unprecedented pace, it can be difficult to predict your future skills needs, leading to more short-term skills gaps. We're seeing how a flexible approach to acquiring talent is working well for one of our clients, a global pharmaceutical company, through a mix of statement of work, contingent gig working, and active talent pooling. They have achieved near constant access to the skills and talent they need through those methods. They are in an enviable position to respond quickly to skills demands in order to meet emerging market challenges. It's also worth bearing in mind that just as technology is changing, the skills businesses need, digitization has also created new ways of working. New generations of workers are increasingly comfortable clocking in part time, working on a contract or project basis, and pursuing other forms of alternative next gen labor that fit with this borrowed strategy. 87% of workers say they're open to these next-gen work approaches, yet only 32%, 32% of employers are offering alternative ways of working, which goes to this flexibility theme that we were talking about earlier. Bridge is perhaps the most complex of the four Bs. As businesses evolve, their skills requirements do too. But before you go to market, it is worth considering how you can manage these requirements using your current workforce. We're currently supporting a large banking group through our right management brand. This client is undergoing a significant restructure as both a reaction to the market changes we've discussed, but also to strengthen their ability to adapt and capitalize on opportunities going forward. One of their main objectives during this restructure is to maximize redeployment as they recognize the value of the skills they have within their organization, even if they aren't currently being applied in the right way. What this looks like in practice is providing individuals with the knowledge, tools, and coaching to identify the opportunities that are absolutely right for them, either furthering their career within the banking group or in a new role, or pursuing opportunities elsewhere. When Bridge is done well, and this is what we're seeing with this client, is a shift in mindset. Instead of an expectation of redundancy, their at-risk employees felt engaged and empowered. Looking at your current workforce, do you have a plan for how you will redeploy, reassign, or, re or release people as your skills needs change? You could have the right skills mix already, 
but individuals are unable to apply them in their existing role. Bridging requires tools including assessment, big data, and predictive performance to identify strengths, define adjacent skills, and help workers create clear career paths. These four Bs can help you focus your talent strategy. You might already be doing some of these. You almost certainly are, in fact. My advice is that proper planning and assessment is key. You need to know where you are today, essentially, who you have in your organization and what skills they possess. And you need an idea of where you're going and the potential skills you're going to need. Once you have established both, you're in a much stronger position to take informed decisions of where to move talent to, which talent to bring in temporarily, who your strategic partner may be. These four Bs provide some structure on how to get from A to B. You need a flexible approach to talent. If you're relying on just one or even maybe two of these Bs, you'll probably struggle. That's not to say you have to embrace all four equally. However, when you're faced with a dynamic market, as we currently are, and will be for the foreseeable future, it's vital that your talent strategy is adaptable and flexible. It's about getting the right mix at any one time. And if you're going to react quickly to market changes, you need to have the right tools and assessments in place now. If the last couple of years have shown us one thing, it is that uncertainty is a certainty. To succeed, employers and workers alike need to be flexible and adaptable. We also say that everyone needs to embrace learnability. So what do we mean by that? We mean that by that, what we mean is an individual's desire and ability to continually grow and adapt their skill set. It's essential, no matter what your job is, as it allows individuals to become more employable for the long term. And for businesses, it's it ensures their workforce is equipped with the skills it needs, no matter how much their requirements change in the years to come. It requires us to build a culture that encourages learning. It's something to also keep in mind when you're recruiting today. In addition to whether an individual is the right match for the role you're currently hiring for, think about whether they possess the attitude and aptitude to upskill, reskill, and adapt. I call it, it's all about the abilities. The, 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 the keys are flexibility, adaptability, and learnability at both an individual and organizational level. As recruitment and HR professionals in what is most definitely an ever-tightening labor market, we need to shift our focus from finding talent to creating and nurturing it. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's back to Simon. Thank you very much, Chris. That was great. So uh, we do have a few questions from questions that have come through. And to anyone uh, who has anything pressing, do feel free to jump in the question box and send them over as we go through them. We've got uh, we've still got a good bit of time to go over anything. So if anyone does have anything pressing or you just want to find out a little bit more information, feel free to drop that in. So we'll start with the first question that I've got here. So it says, Hi, Alpesh, are your forecasts based on a no deal Brexit? And if not, how would they change if we leave the EU without a deal? Um, thanks very much, Simon. Our forecasts are actually conditioned on a smooth Brexit outcome. So sort of we expect um, we expect sort of Brexit to happen by the end of the next deadline, by the end of January. And thereafter, we have a process whereby talks with the EU uh, proceed um, as expected and sort of certainty and clarity is forthcoming um, and quite most importantly we get a transition period until the end of 2020 which facilitates that so our forecasts are actually conditioned on a smooth Brexit outcome and that's what we would expect for the labour market under that scenario um, a no deal Brexit particularly a no deal Brexit that is sort of in its most disruptive form would obviously be a much bigger hit to the economy um, a much bigger uh, hit to financial markets and sentiment. Um, and naturally that you you would expect a downturn in the economy to affect the labor market to to a larger degree um, in that regard. However, you know we do need to learn from the experience of the 2008 nine recession. I said you know that the hit to the labor market was much smaller. Um, than it was relative to sort of previous downturns. Um, and actually, and actually, you know, it may very well be the case this time around, the nature of the UK's labour market is very different to what it was 
um, in the in the sort of in the 80s and in the 70s it's much more flexible firms seem to be much more willing to sort of bear the cost of holding on to employees um, because they see that as less than sort of losing uh, the cost of losing key skills if you like um, when the economy does turn upwards so we would expect a more material hit to the labor market in the event of a no deal uh, but we do need to bear in mind that actually the labor market hasn't behaved uh, as we would conventionally expect over the last few years yeah i was going to if i may i was going to add that i think um what would we, we most definitely need during the course of next year is as much certainty as possible so that we can all plan um, we, we need to know what we're, we're aiming for and, and how we need to get there as well. So that certainty so that we can um, plan more effectively is most, most definitely important. And, and getting some resolution on where we are with Brexit is really important. Great, thank you. And um, in terms of this, Alpish, what sectors will see pay increases in 2020? So we, uh, the, well, the CBI itself doesn't produce a sort of a sectoral forecast of pain. It's probably more useful to, to think about that question in terms of roles rather than sectors. Um, so Chris flagged, you know, a number of roles um, in, in sort of Manpower's latest survey, which, which sort of employers are struggling to fill. And that broadly kind of chimes with the anecdote that we're getting from members. So I mentioned kind of digital cybersecurity. There's a big... Um, there does appear to be sort of a big skills gap there. Um, construction is a sector um, that, that sort of often flags sort of shortages of skill, particularly in things like bricklayers. Um, uh, Chris again mentioned HGV drivers. That is an ongoing uh, issue driven by sort of change in regulation at the EU level a few years ago. Um, certainly financial services and sort of uh, sort of roles related to compliance within financial services. Um, obviously, uh, many banks are sort of seeing a structural shift in their business models, which has been playing out since the crisis, where there is a lot more emphasis on sort of regulatory compliance, um, and they really need um, sectors to sort of fill those key roles. Obviously, those are sort of um, quite skilled sectors. It is it is worth bearing in mind that actually, um, you, you know, that there is a that the the shortage that we're seeing the 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 labour uh, the recruitment difficulties do sort of span all skill levels, and it comes back to what I was saying earlier that those sectors which are uh, quite heavily reliant on migrant labour might very well see more wage pressure if we end up with a tighter immigration regime. Uh, post post Brexit. Um, obviously, sort of, you know, some of these are more structural issues. They go back to sort of the UK having um, a big gap in sort of STEM skills. Others are related to more cyclical issues and sort of related to Brexit. So it comes back to sort of Chris's point about sort of having as much certainty as possible over the Brexit process so that firms can sort of plan for those sorts of things. They can plan for recruitment strategies. They can plan um, where they might need to bump up pay um, uh, for, for sort of key roles. Well, I, I, I'd just like to add, if I may, Alpes, the, um interestingly, the, you talk about drivers and bricklayers, uh, and as we've been uh, evolving, developing our driver academy, I was in the, uh, the yard of one of the driver training partners we work with, and uh, he was, I was asking the question, where, where are you seeing people coming from? What skills areas or what roles are people doing today that are wanting to learn to get an HGV license? And interestingly, he said, look, we're seeing quite a lot of bricklayers coming through because what they like to do is go and work in the sun during summer, um, but they want to maintain the level of pay that they can get as a bricklayer during winter, and they want to sit in a warm, cosy cab during winter. And so they, uh, they're, they're a great example of the gig economy or the kind of um, the seasonality that they can work with. And so uh, they jump in the, the HGV truck during the winter. Um, so it's an interesting uh, concept of, of, of a, a worker wanting flexibility as much as employers looking for flexibility as well. Okay. So moving on, the next question, are there any employers that you think are executing these strategies particularly well? Yeah, so I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that one. Um, <coughs> I'd say that um, there are, it, we, we talk about first, second, third generation clients, those that have got more mature um, kind of buying models of their workforce. And um, in my mind, as I say this, we're talking about 
um, buyers of temporary workers versus maybe um, buyers of permanent workers. And, and in the past, what we've seen are uh, um, procurement really sitting over the buying of temporary workers and HR talent sitting over the kind of buying and acquisition of permanent workers. Um, and across time, that has come together. Um, and, and what we're seeing are what we call total talent management workforce models where uh, the two have to be looked at hand in hand um, because the way in which you go and buy labor as i mentioned with the four b's is all interdependent um, and you had to buy from the market as well as focusing on how you grow and develop your own internal workforce so those organizations have got into that second or third generation of of, of how they manage those strategies um, are probably best equipped to handle the dynamic nature of the environment that we're in today um, but it doesn't mean to say that those who haven't quite got there yet uh, aren't going to get there because I think we're seeing a lot of acceleration of those types of models moving forward uh, and organizations are getting much more cohesive in the way in which they're, 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 they're having to deal with these talent challenges as, uh, as we see them today. hope that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd sort of echo that. I think I think what what we have seen certainly among sort of the CBI's membership base is, is firms actually being quite innovative in how they're looking to sort of deal with their um, recruitment and talent shortages. Um, and, you know, as, as Chris said, sort of firms needing to be a bit more cohesive. Um, so there's been a lot of emphasis on things like sort of secondments and temporary hiring. Um, I mentioned automation um, and that that's, you know, a key theme, particularly for certain sectors like like retail, for example. Um, but also, you know, a lot of firms certainly, um, you know, this time a year ago, a lot of firms were saying we're kind of we're hiring at a, at a sort of a, a more junior level or a more sort of lower level lower skill level and then we're kind of upskilling within our workforce we're sort of investing in training and retraining um, and that of course is is more of a broader retention strategy um, as well as a, as well as a recruitment one as well so you know it, it there are a lot of firms out there who are sort of thinking outside the box when uh, when they when they, when it comes to hiring in the way that they probably uh, didn't have to do in the early stages of the upturn okay thank you both, both. Um, Chris, I think I've got one for you. The four Bs are interesting. How do I get exec buy into the to implement these? Uh, very good question. Um, I mean, of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, is probably a bit easier in, in those those environments where the buying models are, are more mature um, and and the business can see the strategic benefits. Of, of managing those four Bs um, in, in that way. I, I think the, the bigger challenge is probably where, where the buying models are not as, as mature. Um, but obviously we'd be delighted to try and provide some guidance to anyone who wants to uh, explore how to tackle this. But um, it, it, it's linking it to the business strategy. The way I talk about the four Bs is more about okay these are the four pillars that are really key to helping you understand how you can um, get your workforce fit for today but what you've also got to do is identify depending on your business strategy what the workforce skills need to be for tomorrow um, and once you know what those business strategies are and what the skills are that you need to deliver against those strategies then you can kind of reverse go go back to right okay what do i have today and a lot of organizations struggle with understanding what skills they have today but then obviously you can then talk about the four b's helping you understand what you have today as well as helping you build for what you need tomorrow um, but if you can link it to the business strategy uh, which is typically what most execs look at and what they're trying to deliver um, and then work it back to workforce strategy i would suggest that's probably one of the first ways or best ways to try and get their attention and, and make sure they understand that people is at the heart of, 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 of delivering their strategies. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I've got one for Chris and then straight after I've got one for Alpesh. So Chris, what are the main reasons why in 2011 only 21% of employers plan to upskill their current workforce, i.e. a lack of planning or complacency? Uh, this is a good question. I think, um, Back in 2011, if we think about what the labour market was looking like then, it was still qu 
quite uh, buoyant. Um, obviously, here we are now in 2019 going to 2020 with the lowest levels of in unemployment, highest levels of employment, <coughs> and the picture is very different then. So back then, you could go to the labour market and you could probably deal with uh, or find the skills that you need to deliver your business strategies. Um, so, so I think you could say that there might have been some complacency, but I think there was still capacity and capability in the labour market, and therefore focusing on how you need to skill, uh, reskill up, skill what you've got in your own workforce today wasn't such a priority. But as time has gone on, the labour market has tightened, and people have had to become more creative about how they build talent or create talent. And, and, and hence why, uh, and, and the survey shows this trend, because I think off the top, don't quote me on this, but I think around about 25, uh, 2015, 2016, the number had grown when we did the same survey to around about 50, 55% of employers were expecting to have to reskill up, skill their workforce. And now here we are at, at that 80 odd percent level. Um, so so I, I would say that's probably one of the major reasons um, I think there's also other things like um, the kind of the rise in training platforms that we're seeing the the kind of a growing um, training infrastructure through in, in specialist training that's coming through as well. There's obviously been a kind of re re-engineering the the way the uh, apprentice funding works. Um, and so there are many other factors, but I think in the first instance, it's probably that the labour market was able to service what we needed back in 2011. Okay, great. And, and for Alpesh, in your opinion, will we enter a recession in the next 12 to 18 months? Um, the short answer to that is no. Um, the CBI's own forecast, I mean, we don't, we don't expect a recession uh, over the next couple of years, and we forecast out to 2021. Um, there, I mean, we expect growth to be quite subdued, economic growth in the near term. I mean, there are two factors weighing on the economy at the moment. One is uncertainty over the Brexit process. Uh, and second is, is the softer growth that we're seeing in the global economy. And we expect that to persist over the next couple of quarters. Um, but, you know, should that near term uncertainty over Brexit alleviate, you know, if we get if we get a decent deal and talks with the EU on the future relationship do uh, progress steadily, we do expect growth to sort of pick up very gradually. It's not a massive upturn, but it's a gradual pickup in growth. And that's particularly apparent over 2021, uh, when we expect business investment to kind of uh, ramp up a little bit, which has been which has been the main channel through which Brexit uncertainty has hit the economy. Um, and we also expect a bit more juice in household spending as well. And that, that does come back to the labour market story. That does come back to the fact that we do expect uh, a pickup in the labour market. And that's been a big support to household spending over the last 10 years or so, and we expect that to continue. Uh, so we don't expect uh, a recession uh, over the next few years. Um, obviously, sort of, you know, the big game changer for the outlook would be if we have a more disruptive no deal Brexit. And, and in that scenario, we would expect growth to, to be hit quite severely in 2021, particularly, and a recession is not an unlikely scenario. Um, but it's by no means a definite one, just because it's very uncertain in terms of how that would how how the economic impact of that would play out in the near term. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and how do you see graduate recruitment evolving in the next coming years? Uh, there's a good one. We talked about the ageing workforce earlier, and uh, we're most definitely. Uh, I will come back to the question, <laughs> but um, we're, we're most definitely seeing that part of the workforce uh, finding ways in which to work for longer um, for graduates I mean it's a it's a real challenge for graduates isn't it because they 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 got so so many choices um, I mean if I use my own children as an example they they, they almost don't know what to do um, but because there's so much out there and 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 I think because we're also seeing the skills cycles much shorter than they've ever been before which then in turn also applies to some of the job roles that we see in the market that, that they come and go so quickly. Um, but I think with, with graduates, um, I think there's definitely more of a shift uh, and some recognition by some of the big employers as well that um, just getting an academic qualification on its own isn't enough. Um, I mean, I think it certainly shows that you've got an ability to, 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 to learn and, and, and work under pressure and get a result. 
but there's definitely some shift in in how graduates need to demonstrate and prove a lot of the soft skills that are required to help you um, navigate the day-to-day in work, but also demonstrate potential um, desire to learn, ongoing curiosity, ability to 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 flex and adapt. Um, so that is uh, that that's certainly what a lot of employers are looking for. Um, however, I think one of one of my concerns that uh, I keep on picking up in 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 various, uh, in fact, actually in some of the, the regional councils that we do with the CBI and and other um, organisations that we work with, um, both in terms of the client base but other bodies, is that um, uh, the the academic uh, pipeline does need to look at how it can adapt. I think if there's one area of, of, of the way in which we bring talent into the workplace, which hasn't changed a lot in the, in the last few years, is probably a, the, the, the route that we take through school and, and university. Um, so we, we've got to look hard at how we, we modernize that and, and make sure that people that are coming out of school and university are really ready to hit the ground running. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, one more. Uh, Chris, with the labour market as tight as it is, how does an employer make sure they can attract the best talent? Yes, uh, as, an ever, as ever, uh, an ongoing challenge for all of us. Um, and a very good question. So I would say that uh, certainly what we've been uh, looking at for ourselves, let alone uh, in the conversation we've been having with clients, is first and foremost, make sure that you've got a purpose. Um, Secondly, make sure you're flexible in the way in which um, you, you're prepared to work with the talent that you are trying to bring in, let alone retain. Um, and, and, and thirdly, it's not all about pay. I think it's, it, it's about um, non-pay elements as well. Um, for example, we're, I mean, some of it is, is, is related to the, I mean, indirectly related to the pay, I suppose. Uh, we're, we're going through a process of recruiting for, for Christmas. Um, and one way in which maybe uh, one client that we're working with, that, that they would have guaranteed getting people into work would have been to raise the pay rate, the hourly pay rate. Instead, what they've said, look, is we'll give you a minimum uh, guarantee of hours. Um, but also you can earn a little bit more as well on top of that, provided you, you're delivering the customer service that you're required to deliver when you're driving around and dropping off parcels. Um, and so there's some performance incentives in there as well. But also um, within all of that, they're, they're being much more flexible about start times and um, finish times as well and trying to accommodate when people are available to work. So, so I don't think it's just about the core salary. It is about a lot of the other factors which sit around core salary as well. But yeah, those are the main things. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would very strongly echo that. I mean, I mean, Chris's point is quite salient because you know we're hearing that from our members as well. But actually, the the non salary benefit part of sort of a recruitment package it has become more and more important. Uh, in recent years and you know employees and candidates will be looking at at sort of the total package of benefits as well Uh, things like work-life balance is much more important the ability to work remotely work flexibly um, and obviously pay is important but 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 employees will be looking for something or may very well be looking for something more they'll be looking for sort of the the entire package on offer and and in the labor market which is quite tight and, and increasingly competitive um, you know having that edge as an employer is, is quite important good i think we're um, at the end of the hour aren't we um, hey, thank you very thank you both very much um so unfortunately that is all we have time for thank you for all of your questions and if you didn't get a chance to ask them please feel free to get in touch with manpower directly or you can get in touch with in-house recruitment and we'll forward these over to the team uh, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Alpesh and Chris for being a part of this webinar. We covered some really insightful and important points and have introduced the audience to some new ideas and resolutions to some of the challenges that were introduced. To the audience, if you'd like any more information about any of today's discussions, then you can speak directly to Manpower. And also you can you would have seen a call to action here on your screen where you can find a local branch. 
Uh, thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next time and please be aware that the recording will be following this as well so if you didn't manage to see if you arrived a little bit later you didn't manage to see everything please have a look at that uh thank you and have a good day thanks very much thank you